Bibles, please, and turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 23. I want to talk to you for a little while about the, the, the difference between being orthodox or being spiritual. Now, orthodox is a good word that mainly we use in connection with re religion. Is he orthodox Jew? That means, does he go by the old line right down the line? Because they also have reform synagogues. Okay? It doesn't just apply to what the Jews do in religion. A lot of times we take little things like that and we say, yeah, that, that goes for the Jews. No, no, no. A lot of folks who are orthodox, that is, they have the right body of truth, they say they embrace that body of truth, but there's no demonstration of it in their lives. When Jesus got over here to Matthew chapter 23, he is really tough in Matthew 23. There's a place where they're, they talk about judgment day. We're all going to stand before Jesus Christ someday in judgment. I know that's not news to you, but that's the kind of news you really don't want to hear. You ever feel yourself looking at the news, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, and that old newscaster's just laying it on you, and you, you're saying to yourself, I wish I hadn't listened. There's so many cruddy things going on in the world, I, I wish I'd just gone on to bed and thought, well, I'll worry about it rather than know what it is. Well, Jesus said, there are going to be a lot of folks who are going to stand before me, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this, and didn't I do that, and didn't I do the other thing? And Jesus is going to look at him and say, I never knew you. He isn't going to say, I knew you once and you fell by the wayside. He's going to say, I never knew you. And lest you be one of those people kind of stumbling along through life without taking a good look at what the scripture has to say, about the difference between being orthodox, just knowing what the story is, and those who are spiritual, who have plugged into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and are allowing this whole thing to function in their body. I want you to be in that second category. And so I want you to take a look in Matthew 23 at some things that Jesus said. Now, a lot of folks have this little picture in their mind of gentle Jesus, meek and mild. They never see him as being tougher than a boot. They never see him as being so head on that he just drives them to the wall. But you look at him in Matthew 23, he's talking to the crowds. He's in beautiful downtown Jerusalem doing this, okay? He's not off somewhere 400 miles from home base. He is in beautiful downtown Jerusalem laying out the word, and he talks about those who are orthodox in outward things. Verse 4, he says to this crowd of people, he's talking about the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees. He said, they load you with impossible demands that they themselves don't even try to keep. See, those who are orthodox but not spiritual, they're interested in seeing everybody else keep the rules. I had a guy say to me the other night, talking, he opened up just a little bit. We were at a dinner party, and he just opened up a little bit, and I, I, I kind of plugged him because I've been praying for him for years that he'd give his heart to Christ. And when he opened up that little bit, I said, that commitment needs to be made, my friend. And he looked at me, and he said, Buf, the church has got too damn many rules. And I said, that's a bunch of bull, and you know it. There are times, I'm sorry, you're not supposed to talk that way from the pulpit, see, but there are times when you're out there at a party, and you can do that, see. That's just a report. You see, the guy that's going to hide behind the rules, he knows better than that. He knows we're not talking rules, we're talking a relationship. These guys are into rules. Look at verse 5. Everything they do is done for show. These people who are orthodox and all, they act holy by wearing on their arms little prayer boxes with scripture verses inside and by lengthening the memorial fringes of their robes. Everybody knew what that stuff meant. Now, never in my life 
have I gone to the limits that these folks have gone to? Where they, they, they take these little boxes. They not only put them on their arms, they put them around their foreheads. The scripture had said, bind these on your forehead. And so some smarty came along and said, we'll do what God wants us to do. We'll get strange and weird. We'll make little boxes and we'll write Bible verses on the little boxes and we'll tuck them inside the little boxes and we'll put a little leather strap and we'll fasten a little buddy around our head and we'll walk down the street. Now you think punk rockers look weird walking down the street. Can you imagine some joker walking down the street, a little box tied on his forehead and he's got Bible verses in that little box. I don't want any weirdos like that hanging around here. See, they're more interested in the public image of making everybody think they are very, very spiritual by doing some weird, strange thing. Look at verse 13. It says, woe unto you, Pharisees and you other religious leaders, you hypocrites. You won't let others enter the kingdom of heaven and you won't go in yourselves. Their unbelief keeps others from a reality with God and causes other people to stumble. And they have no reality in their own life. But they are doing religious action up the bucket. Verse 14, he says, you pretend to be holy with all your long public prayers while you're evicting widows from their homes. You're out in public doing big religious things while your greed drives you to throw folks out because they can't pay their rent. Verse 15. You go to lengths to make one convert and then turn him into twice the son of hell that you are yourself. That's Jesus talking. Somebody says, that's why I don't like these modern speech translations. No, that's why you need a modern speech translation. You need to understand Jesus was just that far up front with these people when he was laying the wood to them here. He said, you're very busy. You have much religious busy work going on, but there's no blessing in the thing. One of the principles we learned in the Bethel series, Genesis chapter 12, born and blessed to be a blessing. That's what ought to be happening through the believers in this congregation as we scatter out through this community. We ought to be somehow blessing the lives of people that come into contact with us. Look in verse 23. He said, yes, woe upon you Pharisees and you other religious leaders, hypocrites. You tithe, that is you give one-tenth down to the last mint leaf in your garden. I, buddy, that is nitpicking. Huh? You tithe one-tenth of the mint leaf in your garden. But you ignore the important things, justice, mercy, and faith. Yes, you should tithe. And I say amen, don't forget the little boxes by the doors as you go home, you know. You should tithe, but you shouldn't leave the more important things undone. Justice, mercy, and faith, that's the guts of the issue right there. Jesus said you've got yourself all hooked up in all the trifles. Well, you neglect the most important matters. And then when he gets down to the end of it, look at 25 to the end of the chapter, he said, woe unto you. You are so careful to polish the outside of the cup, but the inside is foul with extortion and greed. Blind Pharisees, first cleanse the inside of the cup, and then the whole cup will be clean. Woe unto you. You are like beautiful mausoleums. Think of this next time you walk through a mausoleum. Boy, all the marble is polished. Just looks so gorgeous, there's only one problem. Get behind the marble and what do you got? Look here, Jesus said, you guys are just like mausoleums, full of dead man's bones and of foulness and of corruption. You try to look like saintly men, 
But underneath those pious robes of yours are hearts besmirched with every sort of hypocrisy and sin. Woe unto you, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build monuments to the prophets killed by your fathers and lay flowers on the graves of the godly men they destroyed and say, we would never have acted as our fathers did. You see, when you get this picture of those who are guilty of outward shining and inward sinning consistently, you're beginning to get the picture of those who intellectually hold a body of truth in their mind, but they've never released it to go to work in their bodies, and they're lost because they've never established a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it's a good question for us to ask and say, well, then when is it real? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. You see, a person who is spiritually real will be excited about what Jesus Christ has done for him. Think of somebody in your frame of reference whom Jesus Christ has really changed. Just think for a moment. Is there someone that, that you can capture in your own mind and say, I remember him, there is for me. I think about a guy who's in this church. I remember when I first met him. It's been a number of years ago. We were over in the little building then, and that gets to be more and more years ago that we were over there in that little place. And, and, and this guy, his father died. His sisters and their families both came to the church and when they called me and asked me to do the service for their father and I was to come over to the house, they said, look out for our brother. He doesn't like preachers. And the truth was, he was just a hell-raising drunk. That's all he was. And I went over there and somehow, I, you know, I was aware that he was there and I tried not to get in his road and tried not to upset him too badly, but somehow he got hooked a little bit and he began to come to church. And he hated to travel alone. You know, there's some places you don't want to go alone. Church is one of those places you don't want to go alone when you're not saved. You want to have a friend with you that's worse than you are. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the way it is. And he'd come in and he'd bring these old boys in and, and he'd come over and, and, and introduce me to his friends. And, you know, he'd say, Buf, I want you to meet Sam. He's one of my drinking buddies. And poor old Sam would want to go right through the floor at that point because here he has his marvelous tag on him when he's being introduced to the pastor. But, you know, one day Mike called me and said, I want to see you. And we sat together in that little dinky office we used to call the cubbyhole that was my place over there in the other building. And I watched Mike Coop that day give his heart to Christ. And this, you know, he was, he was a, what I call a dumb drunk. He just wanted to get drunk so he'd go out and fight and get all beat up. And I watched that man change. I watched tremendous, beautiful changes in his life. Now, he isn't perfect yet, but he's sure a lot different than he was. A lot of great moves made in that man's life. Now, when you think about that and you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, it says, never forget that you once were heathen. You, believer, you once were a heathen and you were called godless and unclean by the Jews. Remember, the Jews thought this whole deal was for them. Verse 12, remember that in those days you were living utterly apart from Christ. You were enemies of God's children and he had promised you no help. Isn't it amazing that the one word in the scripture to the person who is lost, other than the fact that he can be saved if he would come to Christ, is right here. The promise, if you are outside of Christ this morning, if you do not know Jesus Christ, God has promised you one thing. No help. Isn't that marvelous? When you get into a situation where everybody around you is screaming, Oh God, help me! Don't even bother. Because God has promised you no help. When the train is going over the cliff and into the ocean, 7,000 feet below, don't even bother to holler because God has promised you no help. 
See, we have this funny little picture of God that he's kind of a cross between Santa Claus and a grandfather. And he can't turn us down. And we just come running in and say, oh God, it's me. And God said, oh, isn't that precious? Isn't that wonderful? Well, I'm sure you're going to be back. God has promised you no help. Bank on it. In the day of judgment, no help. The only great thing is the day of judgment is not here yet. So the day of grace is still open. And so he still says, whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. Door's still open. Still a place for you. He said you were lost without God and without hope. That's where many of you once were. Some of you still are. He says now you belong to Christ Jesus. And though you were once far away from God, now you've been brought very near to him because of what Christ Jesus has done for you with his blood. The importance of the death of Christ cannot be overemphasized. It's the key. It's the heart of the issue that he died to redeem us and he rose again from the dead to guarantee to us eternal life. And those two great eternal truths must be embraced Totally, not just intellectually assented to, but embraced totally for you to become a spiritual person. And having become a spiritual person, there's a difference in what goes on in your life. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Boy, when you get to Ephesians chapter 4 and he begins to talk to Christian people, he said, let me say this then, speaking for the Lord, verse 17. Live no longer as the unsaved do. For they are blinded and confused and their closed hearts are full of darkness and they are far away from the life of God because they have shut their minds against him and they cannot understand his ways. They don't care anymore about right and wrong and have given themselves over to impure ways. They stop at nothing, being driven by their evil minds and reckless lusts. But that isn't the way Christ taught you. If you have really heard his voice and learned from him the truths concerning himself, then throw off your old evil nature. See, we want that all to just be automatic. We want to say, boy, I got saved and everything just turned around and it was zip and doo and there I was. And no, 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 that's not what the Bible says. He says, you, fella, you are a Christian. You are in Christ. You throw off your old evil nature, the old you that was a partner in your evil ways, rotten through and through and full of lust and sham. Now your attitudes and thoughts must all be constantly changing for the better. Yes, you must be a new and different person, holy and good. Clothe yourself with this new nature. Throw off something, put on something. That's active responsibility on our part as believers. Then he says things to believers that you, you, you want to say, well, I don't think this is true. Stop lying to each other. I'm going to tell you what, if we ever get the Christians to stop lying to one another, this town will come to life. That's true. Stop lying to each other. Tell the truth, for we are parts of each other, and when we lie to each other, we're hurting ourselves. If you are angry, don't sin by nursing a grudge. There's no doubt about it. There's some people sitting in this building right now, some Christian people, and you have a little grudge you carry with you everywhere you go. And you nurse that little buddy because he might die if you stop nursing him. That grudge is very important. It gives you a reason to do a lot of things. And the Bible says that's sin, believer. Don't sin by nursing a grudge. Don't let the sun go down with you still angry. Get over it quickly. Huh? You hooked up with somebody that just loves to get angry and see how long they can make it last? You catch them almost starting to laugh and enjoy life a little bit and they think, nope, I'm still angry and I'm going to make it last two, three more days. I can get a little more mileage out of this anger. He says, believer, that isn't to be your life. If anyone is stealing, he must stop it and begin using those hands of his for honest work so he can give to others in need. Don't use bad language. 
Say only what's good and helpful to those you're talking to and what will give them a blessing. You see, the child of God should demonstrate a discernible difference in his life if other folks are to look at his life and say, I want what he's got. Ought to happen. That's why when I had you read that Second Peter chapter 1 last week and think about the areas where there's been growth and also make a list of the areas where there needs to be growth. I didn't ask you this morning, what are the areas where there needs to be growth? That's none of my business. That's between you and the Lord. Those are areas you need to work on and I hope that you are. I hope that you find yourself, look at verse 30. Don't cause the Holy Spirit's sorrow by the way that you live. Remember, he is the one who marks you to be present on that day when salvation from sin will be complete. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by the way you live. Encourage the Holy Spirit by the way that you live. You ought to bear some great fruit. Stop being mean, bad-tempered, and angry. Quarreling, harsh words, and dislike of others should have no place in your lives. Instead, be kind to each other. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you because you belong to Christ. Oh, listen, believer. As those who have trusted Christ and are plugged into the spiritual side of life, there needs to be the positive action of our lives that is the action of faith that causes those around us to say, I want to be identified with this same Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's good for us to ask ourselves how much effect does our Christianity have on our behavior? Because when it has a tremendous effect on our behavior, it'll begin to touch the guy out there that's outside of Christ when he begins to understand we have a purpose of life that is not just to poke the Bible down their throats, but it's to share the love of Christ with them and the caring attitude that we have that causes them to want to be born into the family of God. You see, it isn't that we're just trying to live life with all the success symbols hanging over us. It's if we can live life, the life of faith that causes others to understand that we are committed to God no matter what, if it takes the hide and the hair and everything else, we are committed to God by faith in Christ and nothing is going to turn us away. I think of the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace in Daniel chapter 3. Those three guys were absolutely at the verge of being burnt to death. An angry king saying to him, I'll give you one more chance. We will strike up the band. When you hear the band, you'll fall down and worship the image. Give you one more chance. And those three Hebrew guys said, don't bother. Don't bother. They said literally, we are not careful to answer you. We are not bowing down. Number one, our God can deliver us. But number two, if he doesn't choose to deliver us, that's okay. We are not bowing down to a false god. You see, that kind of faith, which put them in the fiery furnace, they didn't have any notion. See, we get on this side of that thing and look at it and say, isn't that a marvelous story? Those old boys were there where they had made their declaration and they got tied up and thrown into the fiery furnace. And sure, we know they got out. They didn't know they were going to get out but they were ready to take the stand, the commitment. That level was never higher in their lives than when the greatest pressure was on. This week, I want you to do something. I want you to read Ephesians 4, verses 17 to the end of the chapter, daily. And I want you to have the courage to ask yourself if there's any faith in motion in your life. Have you found yourself shake, shaping up as that chapter says you should as a believer? Maybe as a non-believer you have the courage to read those chapters and look and to say, my problem is I'm not even a Christian. I've never trusted Christ. I believe in my mind there's something to all of this, but I've never given my heart to Christ. We still wait for you to make the first move.
to pull a card out of the rack and to put it in the mailbox as you go out the door to say, I need somebody to talk to me. We'll help you if you let us. Let's bow for prayer. Thanks, Father. Your word is so plain. You, you've, you've had the courage all the way through your word to talk to us like we really are. The perfection that we have comes from what Christ did for us. And he wants to change our lives consistently if we'll only let it happen. I pray that we would open ourselves to what you want to do. For Christians that have areas where they need to get right with you, give them the courage to do it. For those that have never given their hearts to Christ, give them the courage to make that step. As we read Ephesians 4, 17 through 32 daily this week, we give the Spirit of God the privilege and the right to bring conviction to us. May we go to the source of forgiveness, even Christ himself. Bless us as we go. Do your good work in us. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to have you here. Hope to see you somewhere along the way this week. Take care.